action. Okay, sweet. Here we go. I'll just play a little intro and then bring you in and off we go. Okay. It begins in three, two, one. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of The Instance. We like to call this our annual Let's Interview Corey uh, episode of the show. Corey Stockton, lead content designer for World of Warcraft, Dungeons, Zones, Battlegrounds, Garrisons, Pet Battles, so many other things that maybe he'll tell us a little bit about today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Corey to the show. Corey, welcome back. Thank you. It's always awesome doing the show. Yeah, we did this right before Pandaria hit, I want to say. Um, yep. And I remember, this is a distinct memory of that interview, that you seemed super chill, like ready to go, launch day was looming, like you were feeling good about everything. How do you feel this time around? Um, I, I mean, I would say we're feeling pretty confident now. Um, we Doing the pre-patch is really the thing that gives us that confidence, right? Being able to say we've got a little bit of time beforehand and we can figure out anything that's dramatically wrong and fix it before the game goes live. Um, things actually went pretty smooth for 602, a few hiccups like you would always expect, but... Uh, Honestly, nothing that we were really, you know, running around chickens with our head cut off type thing. Well, with um, this particular expansion, it seems like there was a lot more beta participation than usual and also earlier and it just felt broader. Did that contribute to, um, you know, I, I suppose a more confidence leaning toward launch? Yeah, I think it was that. And I think it was also just a feeling of we had a lot of things for people to test and a lot of new stuff. So I think we definitely felt like we were going to get a lot of people in the beta to actually try the things that we had. Um, obviously, Garrisons was completely new, right? So that's a thing that a lot of people just wanted to check out. And the hope was, you know, when they come in to see maybe the one new thing, they would then fan out and play lots of other stuff as well, right? Obviously, we want everything to be tested. Um, so I think we felt like we had enough fresh stuff that we were definitely going to get a lot of people in the beta. Well, it's right around the corner. I mean, literally, we're talking less than a month and... That's crazy exciting for me as a player, but from your perspective, one thing that's different this time around, it seems like anyway, is this seems like the closest in proximity in time that an expansion is coming out to when BlizzCon ends. Is Does that add extra pressure? Do you feel an extra uh, boost to to get excited about BlizzCon because of it? Like, What does that do to a team and, and, and to the guys you work with? I think it's honestly actually super awesome. Um, originally, I think we, we thought about that concept and we were all kind of really scared because of everything that goes into launching the game and, and all the people that have to work extra hours and do everything to make it happen. But when you think about BlizzCon, and it's really kind of the biggest celebration of, of all things Blizzard for the course of the year, the opportunity to launch the game and have people you know, fly home a day after BlizzCon and be able to log into Warlords right away, I think that generated a ton of excitement across the team and got everyone really pumped, even though it's going to be a little bit difficult technically to pull that off so close to BlizzCon. I think the excitement around it has really outweighed all of that, and we're super hyped about it. I mean, are the challenges basically that you're going to have people with a lot of long nights and server folks trying to make sure stuff stays the way it needs to, and all all of which will so, still be sort of recovering from whatever BlizzCon is? Are those really the only challenges to the team, or do you or do you feel like? I mean, it seems to me a, a company as big as Blizzard, and with guys as seasoned as you guys are with this process that you wouldn't pick the week after BlizzCon unless you really felt <laughs> like you had this figured out. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're, you're, you're definitely right. I mean, it's definitely all about uh, how is the infrastructure going to work. Um, BlizzCon itself is literally mind-boggling in scale from what we have to do. Um, I mean, honestly, Blizzard really tries to do as much of BlizzCon as they can on our own. That's why we keep it close here so that that experience really feels like something that's put on by Blizzard. We have as many Blizzard employees there as we possibly can. You know, like we've said all along, it could be bigger, but if we did that, I think people that came would, would have less of a chance to get that interaction with Blizzard folks or get that feel. Um, and I, so when you combine that with, with the new game coming out so close, I think it's just going to feel like actually a really special BlizzCon for a lot of folks. Yeah. Well, I've asked you this three expansions in a row, <laughs> so I got to ask again, what aspects of the expansion are you most stoked about? What features are jumping out for you? Um, I mean, obviously, Garrisons is huge um, just from the fact of it's going to feel completely new, um, something that's really fresh. Um, we knew we had to have something there by the fact that we weren't going to have 
you know, a new race or a new class specifically for this one. So we had to have something that really filled that gap and really changed WoW in a big way. Um, the other part about that is just the fact of seeing so many of these characters that we've talked about for so long. Uh, going to Draenor gives us that chance to see people that we've only heard about, right? Like, you know, Kargath is someone that players might not really know that well, but they've definitely probably heard the name or they've, they've been somewhere in Azeroth that's named after him, right? So to get a chance to explore some of those things, I think really hits home with what we were going for here, which is something that feels super, super Warcraft. So if, when you guys see the work of the cinematics team and they put together that Lords of War series. Oh, man. Does that kind of stuff, I mean, I assume this would be true, but I assume those kinds of things even though you guys aren't directly involved with them. And I know it's a very collaborative experience across the board yeah. of Blizzard, but those things have to inspire when you're trying to build content and sort of functionality around the story when you get to see stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Those things are they're crazy for us. So I can tell you how that process kind of works. Like the way that the team gets to see it is we have like a monthly team meeting uh, on the WoW team where we all get together and we kind of review, you know, big stuff for the whole team. And a lot of times during those meetings, we'll have the guys come down and they'll show us their work in progress on what's going on. Uh, the Lords of War stuff was one of those things that we got to see from early storyboards all the way through to the end. And uh, every time they showed something, you know, the room would just get so quiet and everyone would get so caught up in it because, you know, we're trying to tell these stories through the game. But there's just some things you can't do in the game with polys the same way that you can do in a video like that with just a great engrossing story, a crazy art style that we can't do. And I think it really drove a lot of people to go back to the game and actually put more stuff in, add more flavor. Is there something from that movie that we can put into the game? Well, it's it's probably no surprise to people at Blizzard that, and part of the reason they do them is because the player base gets super energized around this. I see those things and I just go, oh my gosh, let's get in there. Let's play, let's oh, yeah. go. I, I, But no one ever really thinks about, well, does it do that same thing for you guys internally? And you say yes. It totally does. It's a it's a big part of our job, right? I mean, especially those of us that have been on the team for a long time, right? I'm coming up on 10 years on the WoW team here, and it's like, you know, we stay on this team because we love it. We love what we're making. We love the game. And I think that really says a lot that we have a lot of people on the team that have been here for a long time, right? And I think it's the fact that we just really love what we do. If we didn't like seeing those movies, I think we'd question, like, why are we even working on the game, right? If that doesn't get you jazzed up, like, what really does? Yeah, you hit, let's see, nine years in June, was it? Yep. Um, that's a long time to be anywhere. And oh, yeah. hearing hearing you describe it, it sounds like uh, once you're there, you're sort of home and you don't want to go anywhere else. Yeah. I could see that. <laughs> well, are you worried? So here's a couple of things people have been throwing around. Are you worried at all? Yeah about one of the one of the key features of this new expansion is if you bought the game that and pre-ordered it you got a boosted level 90 character oh yeah and this is a great way to rejuvenate folks who have been away for a long time and want to take old characters forward or this is even a better way for somebody new to the game who can just sort of jump right in play with their friends and can sort of go for it are you worried at all uh about the boosted character experience kind of how to tackle the uh, the leveling of these characters. And I know if you did it post to this recent patch uh, or at the time of the patch, you could go in, boost that character, and then kind of have a almost um, Death Knight-like experience in building up those skills in kind mm -hmm. of a slower way. And then there's some of us like me who was too excited and just boosted the minute I could oh, yeah. um, and then sat on him for, for a while. <laughs> and in that case, he's just going to jump right in, all skills in tow, and everything's ready to go. How are, are you guys feeling about that? And are you worried at all about how the players will deal with this decked out level 90 character and not maybe knowing quite what to do with him? Yeah, I think it's totally a concern. Um, it's something new for us, number one. Anything that we do that's brand new to the game, I don't think we ever put in and just think, oh, boom, nailed it, you know, <laughs> done with that. Let's move on to the next patch. Yeah. Um, I think we've realized over the years that, you know, we can give everything our best shot and get it into the game, but that's just the beginning, mm -hmm. right? Then we've got to get the feedback. We've got to see how it plays out. Obviously, we want to nail it as close as we can when we start. Um, but I think if that's one thing we've learned over the years, it's, it's that kind of stuff that when you put anything in the game, it's not going to be final. Uh, specifically about the characters, it's something we've talked about a ton, right? When this game has gone on for so long, there's a ton of buildup, right? You know, you have classes that have like 40 or 50 buttons. Um, that's just daunting for anyone. We hear it all the time here at Blizzard. Of, you know, people, obviously a lot of people here play WoW, but they leave. 
and they come back. They want to check out the new expansion or they want to check out a new patch. You know, you hear so many people say, oh, man, just setting up my character. I think I'd rather just just roll a new one. Yeah. You know, it almost be like a more exciting experience. So when we hear stuff like that, we want to do things to help ease people back into the experience. But it's a balance, right? You also don't want to get rid of the people that they know exactly what they want. And they're like, why are you making me play this with like three abilities? Yeah, it's an, inter- it's an interesting RPG problem because I feel this way in even Diablo, for example, where uh, if you if you get in a get a character and then you have a bunch of high level friends rush you through some content to just quickly power level you or something. Oh, yeah. Before you know it, you got 50 new skills you didn't know you had and you're left not knowing what the hell to do with any of it. Yep, you've just been sticking to the edge of the screen just enough so you get the the XP. (laughs) Yep, stay away from the the, the pink lasers and you're good. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So it seems like the same kind of problem. And I've had this feeling before where, in fact, with the first boosted character, I, I boosted the shaman up to 90 and I immediately went, well, I don't know what to do with this guy. And I kind of had this this sense of like, well, if I could just start from zero, yep. I'll be able to see this all again, which is kind of counter to the whole idea of having a 90 uh, yep. or having that boost. So I have to imagine this has caused at least conversation, if not, you know, lots of discussion about how to handle it. It totally has. It's it's also influenced one of the decisions we made for Warlords, which, which was to actually do some pruning on the abilities. We had talked about that for years, right, that we were going to prune abilities. We wanted to try to reduce the button count. Um, but really, we knew this is the one that we had to bite the bullet and do it on here, because when you combine that with the boost, you know, obviously, it's better if you have less things that you have to kind of take in all at one time. So anything we could do there that would benefit both the max level game and the level up game is going to play into the boost, right? Because there's there would be less things to have to teach someone. Mm. Um, so doing that really fit in well here. But we also knew, like you said, it's just overwhelming. You yeah. know, you come into the game and we've got a little panel in the game that tries to tell you what your simple rotation is. Um, but even that can be confusing. I think that's why we really lean towards, OK, let's just give you a couple abilities, give you some simple stuff to do and let you really feel it out, you yeah. know, and kind of feel like as you're getting your hands wrapped around the character, you know, by the time you finish that experience, you want all the rest of that stuff and you're ready to go. Yeah, I've had a couple of people tell me um, when the when the patch hit last week, I hopped in, a few other people hopped in. And I immediately went to town with a boosted mage mm-hmm. and it felt, I wouldn't say easy, but it was, you know, I wasn't having a hard time. I was killing yeah. dudes. Nobody was killing me. I was nowhere near death, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I had other friends get in, boosted mage, but did it post patch and got the kind of piecemeal approach. Yep. And it was a real challenge for them. Not super hard that they couldn't do it, but it felt more like progression for them. Um, was that the intent, I guess, with that? I think there's also tuning there that's causing issues as well. Mm. Um, That content specifically, you know, certain abilities that we've given you there might not be the best case for some of that content. Yeah. So meaning that we might put you in a situation where you need a specific CC spell or a specific AE or just more stuff to do, like literally to be able to take out what's there. Um, That's some of the feedback that we've seen and things that we're trying to act on on hot fixes as quick as we can. Um, Because I think in some cases we put players in a situation where they had a really small number of abilities and that wasn't enough to get them through what we needed them to progress through in that quest experience. Oh, that's interesting. Now I have uh, a similar but opposite experience happening in raiding. Our flex raid team, after the patch, suddenly could chew through everything as if it was made of paper. (laughs) Um, It was the the greatest buff in the history of the game that wasn't actually a buff. Um, yep. But but I assume that this is just signs. These are all just signs, and I ask it kind of knowingly, but it's all signs of, of just tuning in general. You guys have to go to town on launching the thing, and then it's back to, all right, well, we squished all these numbers plus these 12 other factors combined to make it so this is much harder or much easier than it should have been. I assume it's easier to land on that raid was easier than it should have been and tuned back than it would be if everybody was dying and complaining and you know causing mayhem online. You're exactly right, and that's more of the way we're going to lean in those situations also, right? We're not going to want to put you in a situation where the game is it's difficult enough to play that you don't even want to play, right? Yeah. Um, I think we want to fix things that are more, you know, undertuned than overtuned, right? Sure. Um, but we're also, we've got situations not only with the rating game there, but also just with some of the lower level stuff because of the stat squish. So across the board, people that love to do old content for transmog or things like that, you know, they're going to see different tuning than what they're, expected to Mm. um and you know that's something that we've said all along we wanted to make sure that even with the stat squish that players would be able to do old content just as well as they could before yeah 
Um, and we've leaned easier on that in most cases, that content, um, but there's gonna be places that we missed, you know, where something didn't get set right, we missed a creature, stuff like that. And that's where, you know, both feedback from the community and just get, having us have time before the game officially launches to see all of that stuff. It'll be interesting to see, um you know what that takes to do it seems like a huge undertaking it's 10 years of content and i just oh, i don't even know crazy. how you, i don't even know how you start like i remember when greg years ago talked about the squish on stage like 2011 i guess oh yeah and i remember thinking that sounds like simple math up there on that board but i'm guessing this is a nightmare <laughs> to actually implement at least yeah that was and my it's, feeling. it's not systematic right we can't just say well, we'll just divide all the creature's health by the same value of what we multiplied player's health. You know, nothing works like that. Some things do, sure, but you have to think about all the things in the game over the years that, you know, like trinkets or these individual uh, types of little perks and buffs that have nothing to do. They're not set up on like percentage scalers. Mm. So we really just have to go through the entire game and do a lot of that stuff by hand and figure it out, right? Yeah. Um, so we're gonna miss some things, um, and we just hope you know people are understanding that our goal obviously is to get it all, get as much as we can. If we missed it, tell us about it. We'll get it fixed. You know, we make the game for players, right? And our, it's like we don't want to leave something broken like that if it's like that. Well, con tension. And conversations like this are good for that, I think, because it's difficult. I think from a game, especially a player's experience where they've had nothing but good uptime. Oh, yeah. uh, quality experience the entire time, never seen any major issues. I, some of them might get impatient if they see something and go, well, that's all messed up. How, what's going on? Man, this game might be going downhill or something, when really all they're seeing is this complicated 10-year culmination in we've got to change these numbers, and oh, no, I guess we need to tune that dungeon up or or whatever. Yep. Um, but it's good. I, 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 I guess my point I'm making is having this conversation and people hearing it I think is important because they'll – hopefully gain you know some perspective on what it takes to do that stuff yeah uh, and you know it's i think it's hard for people to understand right a lot of times people are paying a monthly monthly fee for the game i think that you know clearly you expect that everything is going to be right and going to be set up right and that's that's our goal as much as we can we just try to prioritize right so we want to make sure that the things players are doing the most we would focus on those early on you know and then as the priority kind of works down the list we'll get our way two things you know if something's not as popular as something else we're probably going to fix it later in the process that's just the way it works um and i think sometimes it's hard for people you know they want what they that's one of the beautiful parts of wow right is that it's so big you can like any part of the game and that's totally okay you don't have to always play the newest thing and do the newest stuff right. you know if you're just really into fishing you know out in Loch modan or whatever you know, you, you can do that and that should be fine. <laughs> and so I think that also makes it difficult on our end because we, we honestly want to get to anything that we can in an expansion cycle like this that causes such big change. It's just a matter of, of finding it all, checking it down and getting it fixed. Sure, sure. Uh, we got a Twitter question from Craig Smith who asks, uh, and this is a bit of a gear shift, but he says, I'm curious as to the longevity of garrisons. Will they roll into future expansions, constant updates, or is this a drain or only feature? You know, it's something we've talked about from the very beginning. Um, we definitely built the feature to be a Warlords of Draenor feature. That was the idea behind the whole thing. That's why followers and everything that happens in regards to the garrison all takes place in Draenor. You'll notice that you don't get followers, you know, from like uh, from Eastern Kingdoms or something like that. Because if we did decide to not carry forward with it, that would make things really weird. It would make it hard to leave it behind. Uh, like the farm in Pandaria, we were able to leave behind. Locationally, it's in Pandaria. Everything you did was surrounded around that place. Um, we thought about that stuff beforehand, knowing that that might be something we do. Um, the other side of the coin really comes from how does garrisons play out, mm -hmm. you know, over the course of, of Warlords of Draenor? Is it, obviously, we hope it's incredibly popular and that folks love it. Um, if that's the case and we find, you know, that it's something we want to carry forward with, we would figure out a way to take some parts of that and carry it forward if the players love it. Um, but that's just an unknown right now. What we didn't want to do is build ourselves into a corner and build a gigantic new system that we then have to upkeep permanently for the rest of the game. Because you can imagine, you can only do that so many times before we're not really adding anything new anymore. All we're doing is is upkeeping old systems. Sure, yeah. And so I, you kind of have to skirt that line. Well, I'm sure some systems you want that they are you know going to be core systems that need to be kept up for example for sure. you know the basic structure of rating or something like that oh, yeah. but it seems like a feature like this or 
even battle pets. In fact, let's talk about battle pets for a second. Something yeah. you really strongly championed in the last game, uh, had a huge hand in, and I know you had a lot of um, a lot to say about it last time we talked. This expansion still in there, obviously. Battle pets are a thing; mm -hmm. it's still a, a deal, but no new levels. Uh, is that a sign that 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 you know battle pets are not going to be a thing moving forward outside of where they currently are? Not at all. I think that's the same way you would look at the fact that that was a decision that we made based on we didn't think it added any depth to the design. Mm. Uh, we really feel like from the beginning we made kind of a shift part of the way through the development on Miss to decide that the pet battle game was going to be more focused on the collection aspect of the game and a little bit less on trying to make it a perfectly balanced fighter. Mm. Right. I think we realized that wasn't something that was necessarily going to be in the cards. And so we really focused on finding trainers, exploring the world, finding a rare pet, being able uh, to you know pick abilities on that pet, things like that. Um, and we knew that the way we could carry pet battles forward was to continue to add new content to that system. That's yeah. why in 6.0, you will see a ton of new pets. You'll see tons of new NPC pet trainers. We've got new items that give you level ups for the pets. Um, we've got a whole building in the garrisons that revolves just around them. And I think that's the philosophy of we will continue to add content to that system, but it doesn't mean that we always have to continually bloat the system out. Um, I mean, the talents from WoW are a great a great example of that, right? We got to a point where there was like 71 talent points. Yeah, there were a lot. You know, it was like no one felt comfortable even going through the tree anymore, and that's <laughs> where the, the talent revamp really came in is, you know, this is just getting too much. We were constantly adding and not thinking about what does that do to the experience to someone coming into the game brand new. Does it sometimes, this is this is connected a little bit, but does do you sometimes see a, a mod pop onto the scene for the game that <laughs> suddenly is like an autofill for something, like one, yeah. some feature like Talents, for example, and when you see those mods, is that usually a sign, and I don't know, you can probably track the progression as how, how quickly people adopt it, but is that a sign that, whoa, that system... If people are just trying to autofill it with a set number of whatever, that may mean that system needs to either fundamentally change or be removed or, or something. Do you have to get cues like that from things like mods and that kind of stuff? We totally do. Um, I think on our end, it's a judgment call of do we feel like it's something that's really core to the game experience, right? Because as soon as you build it into the game, it becomes exposed to so many more people. You know, someone can say that a mod's really popular. But in the end, when you think about WoW as a whole, even the most popular mod on Curse or something isn't on that many people's systems, right? Mm. So we have to make a decision of, is that extra complication worth it to build it into the game? Sure. Like um, reforging, for example, it seems like I got into this trap where initially I was super interested in kind of hand tweaking everything. And then mm -hmm. Ask, Ask Mr. Robot came along and said, nah, we'll tell you how to just go ahead and run this and you'll be done in yeah. like five seconds. And it got me to wondering when things were announced that, that that would be going away, if that was something that became prevalent, or maybe it was a combination of people are using mods to autofill this thing. And also those who aren't are just winging it, or they're just throwing numbers in there. Or they're not using it at all. Like what reforging probably has a story to it. I don't know if we have time to tell it here, but is, am I at all correct about how reforging went? Yeah, I, I don't think you're far off. I think, you know, the, the key we look for on a lot of this stuff is, you know, is, it, is something gotten so complicated that it's at the point that literally people don't feel like they can do it without having a mod, mm -hmm. right? Like, are we, are we at that point with something? Um, you know, I think you could look at us removing, removing hit and some of the other stats that were, that were never really very understandable by a lot of our player base. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you look at how important hit was to your character, it was like this key stat that you always wanted to have your hit maxed. It was one of the most important things, but I guarantee you many players never really knew that, much less understood how the stat worked just because of the way that it was listed in the character screen. Sure. Um, it's not like it sounded very sexy either. Hit, <laughs> you know, versus like critical strike or haste or something like that. Sure. Um, but you had all these add-ons that would calculate your hit value and show you the percentage and the percentage would like tick down to zero when you had maxed out your hit. Yeah. Um, you know, we had things that showed item level in the game. Uh, you, clearly, we embraced item level, and we now support that throughout the whole game. But that was one of the most popular add-ons there was, was to show item level and see the item level on another player and decide, oh, could I invite that guy to my group? Like, what's his item level? Sure, sure. It was, um, a, it was, a, it was a way to discriminate on those terms. But in, in the case of the, like, um, oh, what was I going to say? So 
when you when you take away something like hit okay yep. i have to imagine hit given its roots in rpg tabletop dungeons and dragons kind of lore right mm-hmm. like it's the core of some of that original pen and paper stuff like are oh, yeah. you going to hit this monster or are you not going to hit him and by that's how much are you going to that's yeah, how it ended up in that's, wow <laughs> that's literally where it came from i'm guessing that was hard to get rid of and and look how long you guys had it i mean you've you've had it for 9 years so was that I'm trying to be a fly on the wall here, but I got to imagine that was a hard sell to say, you guys, we've got to drop this venerable term that's been around since we were all playing D&D in our basements. I think it was it's, it's a much harder thing for players to accept. To be honest, on our end, you know, I think that was something we had talked about for a long time. That is anyone really getting anything out of this stat? You know, like, is this is it fun to look at an item and try to figure out, you know, the choice here of choosing hit over these other things. Is there any fun in that really left? And I think a lot of us on the the dev team had been looking at that for a long time and wondering about is hit really bringing anything to the game? Are there other stats that we could do that, that might be more exciting or do we just not really need hit at all? Yeah. So on our end, it was more of like, when is the time that we can rip off the bandaid and really do that? And let's take dodge with it and let's take a couple other things with it. Um, and we can kind of package that all together and pull them out and really kind of get the game in a place where getting an item needs to be fun. You're, you're, what you brought up with Reforging is a great example of that, right? We really got to a point in Miss where when an item would drop from a, a raid boss, it, you, it, I'm not sure how excited you really were because of everything you had to do to it. Yeah, you never, you know? the, the gone were the days, for, for the most part, not entirely. I mean, if it, was, if it wasn't a tier piece, obviously, that's something I may try on while I'm still well, in the yeah. group. But, but when I have to admit, I'd put it on and oftentimes take it right back off because I knew, right? well, later I got to go do this thing. And then I got to jam it. Mm-hmm. I got to enchant it. I got to reforge it. I don't like the way it looks, so I'm going to transmog it. Yeah. You know, I think for us, it, it really got to a point to where getting an item felt almost a little bit like there was some, some chores associated with it. Yeah. And, it, you know, that's really the opposite of, of what we want. When the item drops, you want it to be awesome you want that moment to feel great and we want to take away or remove any sort of barriers that there are to making that item feel great yeah it's like being I, on it's like being on uh the price is right and they give you a ticket for the new car you bought you got you won but you got to go take that ticket someplace and get it stamped three times and then do yeah. this other thing and i can totally see how that the taxes and the car that you <laughs> yeah. just won, like <laughs> exactly that's no fun <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, that's great. And I think that's where you see a, a real large amount of the changes that are happening in Warlords are, you know, obviously there's some housekeeping going on, but there's also a lot of quality of life mm. where we just want to, you know, gem slots are super cool. No one is denying that gem slots are awesome. We we love jewel crafters. But making have, always having multiple gem slots on the highest item level stuff means that you always have to deal with that. Yeah. So, you know, we want to keep gem slots around. What we want them to do is feel more exciting, to feel more meaningful. And, you know, so it's not like I think a lot of people look at that like you're taking that away from us. Yes, we are reducing the number of gem slots that are available on items. But the overall goal that we see for the game is that items that have gem slots will be much more exciting to find. Yeah, it's a that's again, it feels like a, a Diablo thing. Uh, not yeah. Not that it's borrowed from there, but there's a feeling of excitement that you get when you find a gemmed helm or something because you don't run into them very often and uh, that makes it even more special if everything had gem slots well then what's the value in gem slots well i could tell you that uh, chen's making way too much money on making gems i know that (laughs) um i i had a question about these smaller teams now at blizzard they're making these smaller projects um although it's funny to call them smaller hearthstone's a freaking juggernaut but these are you know smaller smaller teams smaller projects different uh, path and Blizzard's taken in the past. Uh, Mike Morheim's talked a lot about it in recent interviews mm-hmm. and what their philosophy is. I'm curious. Obviously, there is a trickle down from the big WoW team to these smaller teams, even in in the form of people that are from those teams. But there's this trickle down of perhaps inspiration about what to do. Hearthstone itself is based on the Warcraft universe, and so there's a lot uh-huh. there. Obviously. Um, I'm wondering, does it go the other way? Are these smaller teams with some of these cool projects they're working on? Does some of that go uphill? And do you guys find ideas and go, Oh, that's a great idea. We should figure out a way to implement that or, or, you know, the like. Oh, we totally have that. 
Um, I mean, you have that at, at a base level just across Blizzard in general, just by the fact that, you know, so many of us obviously play the other Blizzard games and we th see things that they've done or we see uh, something that's like a brilliant little piece of design and we're like, well, how could that apply to our game in a different way? The way that they did that is so great. You know, nothing really transfers one to one necessarily, yep. Yep. Um, but you're constantly looking at other stuff and feeling like that. Hearthstone in particular, since it's in the, the Warcraft universe, really calls out to a lot of different things like that for us. Um, you've seen a little bit of sharing that we've done through the game by the fact that we have, you know, you can complete an achievement in WoW and that'll unlock, you know, amount for you. That this, We kind of have a little bit of trading back and forth between sure. the games. Sure. Um, it's something we would love to expand upon and do more of that. Right. Um, it's just a matter of finding the right opportunities that feel right. Yeah. Right. Because you don't want to do that in a way where it feels like, well, the goal here is to get you to play both games. You know, I think what we want to do is take people that might be interested in one game and really it's a way to expose them to something else. Oh, you know, if I if I play win a few rounds in Hearthstone, I get this awesome mount in WoW. Oh, you know, I never really thought about this and I never saw this other part of WoW that I didn't get to see. I think for us, we really look at that as more of like an opportunity of a way to see some of those ways that we could transfer stuff between the games. Yeah. Um, so many people that play Blizzard games play multiple Blizzard games, yeah. right? Yep. Well, that's me. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think that's a lot of us here too. That's why I think there's so much opportunity there, not just for us to share members of our teams and ideas within the teams at Blizzard, but, you know, there's lots of cool stuff that we can do to share just things between the games for the gamers themselves. Yeah, well, I love that. I love the idea that there's that level of co uh, collaboration given – you know, the differences between these teams or the differences in their focus and that yet there still can be some sort of common threads there. Yeah. I mean, our sizes are obviously incredibly different yeah. uh, when you look at the Hearthstone team versus us, but there are initiatives that we do on the WoW team that start really small. Yeah. You know, we start things with like five people and let them kick off um, on the next expansion or on like a certain feature. You know, and then they just kind of work together real small, try to figure out all the details. And then we slowly bring people in. They kind of present what they're starting with and try to get a feel from the team of how they feel about that sort of stuff. Um, I, I think a lot of the real big ideas in the team actually start small. And, you know, a lot of times there's a champion of an idea and that person can really, you know, slowly start to get that idea kind of percolating through the team. People start to get excited. And once you have people excited, that's when the crazy magic just starts happening, right? That's when people start to just go off. Yeah. And then, you know, typically we as the player base are pretty stoked when we finally hear about it. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, there are times when the player base, eh, you know, they have concerns, big class changes, ability proning, totally. number squishing. How confident are you that their fears are misplaced or, or are they misplaced? I mean, it does seem like a reasonable thing. To, to think about a game where these kinds of drastic changes are happening, that that might cause some concern for some, but uh, you guys are obviously confident about it. I mean, you know, where's, where's your head at in terms of these kinds of worries? I think our head's at a place that we feel like we are making the most informed decisions we can to make the best game that we can. When we make a decision on that stuff, it's because, you know, we really feel like in our gut, that's the right call. Many times that call is not going to be pretty or feel right to certain players. Um, and that's really where we have to come in and kind of just stick to our guns on some of that stuff and be like, long term, the game is going to be better, you know, by us making this call. And sometimes those calls aren't popular. Sometimes they actually are. Sometimes people uh, like that stuff. A great example was on Pet Battles originally, we were going to have all pets be able to be available on the auction house. Yeah. So you were going to be able to catch any pet in the world, go throw it up on the auction house, and that could be like a way to make money. It could be like a whole new thing in the economy. You know, we thought about that, and we had it in beta like that for a while. And it turned out that it just it didn't make things feel very special. Mm -hmm. Anyone could get anything, you know. Um, the Minfernal is one of my favorite pets out in Fellwood, you know. We made it incredibly rare, super hard to get. Um, and for someone to get it and then throw it up on the auction house right away, I think it, it really takes away from a little bit of what the core design of that find and collect gameplay really was. Mm. And so at that point, though, people really liked selling pets on the auction house. They were like, oh, this is so cool. You know, it was great. But, you know, in the end, I think we thought that pet battles overall would be better if we left wild pets to be, you know, they could only be caught outside. That was the way to get them. You had to actually go to the zone. 
you know, find a pet, have a team to be able to catch it. Long term, we felt like that was the right call. And I'm glad we made that call now because looking back, I think it was the right decision. Well, those pets would have just ended up being another gatherable resource, right? You would have been, a, it's another form of skinning or mining or whatever. Uh, exactly. It's just you're now farming pets and putting them on the auction house for anyone who doesn't want to do it. I suppose that benefited players who didn't want to do it, but I, I think I understand the philosophy. You were building a feature you, you wanted people who wanted to play it to play it. If that makes well, sense. and I think the key there is that the decision played back into what the core philosophy for the feature was, which was collection, mm. right? And so we were doing something that in the end actually directly went against the collection, right? You were just spending gold in the auction house to get it, which can create a cool economy. There were certainly benefits to that, but a lot of times we've got to stick to when we have a feature, what are the core goals of this feature? And if we do anything that really takes away from that core goal or that core philosophy, it's probably not the right call. And those are the really hard decisions to make because a lot of times people aren't going to like those calls. Yeah, I could see that. Um, yeah, but like you said, I think we've just been doing it for a while. We have a lot of people in the team that have been here for a long time. And the hope is that our, you know, our community has faith that we're doing everything that we can to make the game better. Right. And that, what else can we ask for as players? I don't, I'm not sure there's a good answer to that. Uh, there are a bunch of tweets and emails I got all asking about something I'm 100% sure you cannot tell me, which is this. Battle, <laughs> battle pets on iOS or Android, is there ever a chance that that's ever happening? There's a chance for, for anything to happen, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, that's something we totally talked about a ton during the Missipendary development. Um, I think really the core issue of that came down to what would the exciting gameplay that we could make on mobile be? Yeah. Right? Um, when you, you look at Hearthstone, clearly that game from the ground up can work well on mobile. I think anyone who saw it thought right away, oh my gosh, yeah. you know, having this be on, on an iPad is awesome and your mind instantly goes to the phone. There's a bunch of UI issues we have to sort out, obviously. Um, but outside of that, I think something like that can work really well. When you look at any part of WoW and we think about how do we translate it to mobile in a way that actually makes the game uh, better for it, I think that's a really, really hard thing to think about. Um, and for Pet Battle specifically, the goal of the system really was to get you out into the world, to get players into parts of World of Warcraft that they might not have been in a long time. You know, how long had it been since you had been to Felwood? You know, probably been a long time since someone had been there. But if you wanted that pet, that's sure as heck where you went to go get it. And we thought that was a really, really awesome part about that feature. Yeah. Um, I hadn't really thought of it that way, though. Like, if you, if, you, if you give somebody a portable way to play into WoW with the pet battles on the go, that sounds awesome on paper. Yep. But from a design perspective, it distracts from... Well, the aspect you just described about Fellwood or anywhere else you haven't been in a long time or the actual, I guess, the milieu of the adventure of it all, that all goes away most likely. You're not necessarily saying to people, hey, not only we're going to work on a, a mobile uh, pet battles, but you'll be able to run your character all around Azeroth just like normal. That entire yeah. piece of that equation gets pulled out and then and therefore you have a lesser experience. I, I hadn't really thought of it that way. Yeah, and I and I think there's ways around that stuff, right? Everything doesn't have to end up like that. I think if we if we had enough time, enough resources, and enough efforts to really put into it and think of, is there something big here that we could do? I think we could come up with the right thing. Mm -hmm. It's just it, you know that's not our pure focus right now. The focus for WoW is to build the best expansion we can, and the core platform for that is the PC, right? And so that's where we put all of our focus. I think if we have that that brilliant idea that the team is behind and we feel like is going to make WoW better by having a mobile component there, I think you would see us act on it. Yeah. Especially now that Blizzard has more experience with mobile with what's happened with Hearthstone. Um, I think it's just a matter of we need, you know, it's got to be the right thing. We don't want to do it just to have something uh, like on an app store, right? You right. want to do it because it's going to make the game better. Sure, that makes perfect sense. So we're nearing uh, 10 years for WoW. And you're ninth oh, year yeah. on the team, like we talked about. Are there during those nine years, almost ten, uh, moments that you're most proud of in the game, in design? Like, if you had to just call something out, and it's obviously a more philosophical, you know, looking back kind of question. But what really stands out as a hot moment for for Corey Stockton at Blizzard? Man, there's been a lot of fun stuff uh, over the years. Um, I think 
You know, probably the thing I'm most excited about that I worked on that I loved every single aspect of was being able to design and implement a lot of Dalaran mm. um, as a city. Uh, that was one of my main tasks I worked on for most of Lich King. Um, and it was the some of the most fun I've had here at Blizzard ever, right? Just because you had a chance to take this place that players were like kind of familiar with, you know, from... Uh, Hillsbrad, like it was like a place they kind of knew about, uh, but we had a chance to reinvent it in a way that totally fit the expansion. And uh, we had so much story to inject into it with the Kieran Tor and Alliance and Horde and Violet Hold and, and all this stuff. But at the same time, we were just coming off the fact that, you know, I had worked a ton on Shatrath also. It was mm -hmm. another city I was pretty, pretty <laughs> involved with. And Shatrath, I wouldn't call like a great success. Shatrath was big hard to navigate. In a lot of ways, it felt kind of empty. It certainly looked epic, but I don't know if it was the best experience. So coming off of that and getting a chance to do Dalaran, it was like, okay, here we go. Yeah. Now we can make a place that feels like what I really think uh, something like this should feel like, right? And just, it was an awesome experience because there's so many people involved in it, right? It's not like any one person makes any part of WoW. Uh, but it was a part that I got to play a big hand in and it was, uh, I think it came out awesome and it's still one of my favorite places. Yeah, mine too. And it's funny you should say all this cause, um, it has the quality of a place that was, uh, and the way you describe it, you sound like a kid with a, a box of Legos in a way. Like you, oh, yeah. you were given a chance to say, all right, we got light, nice little tight alleyways. We got kind of parts oh, of the yeah. city that are a little scary and weird. Where are we going to put portals? I, that sounds like a really fun idea. Not only that, but you don't even have to worry about all right, well, how does this butt up against Eastern Plague Lands? Or how, how is the, where do the barons run on the side of this thing so the rest of the world is cohesive? You literally have a floating island, and you just can build that thing to be whatever the, the hell you want it to be. That sounds and, like a riot. Yeah, and just think about being so into WoW, you know, being on this team and, and having a chance to build a place that you know players are going to spend an inordinate amount of time for the next, like, couple of years, right? It was just so fun to be able to say, okay, well, let's build a trade skill district. That's mm -hmm. something. Let's build a whole a whole place where there's like a separate building for every trade skill. And let's get let's get decorations that go outside the buildings yeah. so that when you're running down the street, you could look over and say, oh, okay, the door to that building looks like an alchemy vial. That's clearly the alchemy shop. Like to be able to have those ideas, pitch them, talk to other folks about them, and then see it all come to life. You know, I think that's just, it's a really rare experience and it makes you realize where we work here at Blizzard. You just really get to see if you can think about it. I mean, honestly, we can, you can really make it happen. Do you feel uh, a little melancholy or sad when you go into that place and see how empty it is now? Yeah. I mean, it's a functional sure. uh, thing, right? I mean, the game, the game goes on, the cities don't stay capital cities necessarily. I mean, Orgrimmar and, and Stormwind are different, but but you know they they are they have this purpose that they serve sometimes in a very specific expansion kind of way and then mm -hmm. poof Shatrath the same way it's just a kind of a ghost town by design or you know gameplay wise it's just the way it turns out going there's weird now you know it feels so empty and it used to be this bustling with everybody all the time i'm, I'm curious how it feels to someone who had such a big hand in making it you know i think a big part of that is that you just uh from the beginning we knew it wasn't going to last yeah you know, um, we had, it was a huge art task to build Dalaran uh, from the ground up and a ton of people helped, you know, spawn it and flavor it up and get it to where it is. But I think a lot of us knew going in, it was going to be, it's like Ice Crown, right? Ice Crown was amazing. One of my favorite raids ever. But, you know, once we got into Cataclysm, it was pretty much left behind, Yeah. you know, and I think a lot of us are really used to things at that point, right? And so that's why you kind of try to inject as much flavor into those places as you can. Um, I think the sewer in Dalaran is like a really good example of that. We didn't really have a lot of big ideas about what the sewer was supposed to be or what it was going to mean. We just knew it sounded really cool <laughs> to build like an area underneath the city where some like some shady dealers could be. Maybe that's where like the PVP guys go. Um, and, you know, we were able to realize that. And it was just like this cool little thing. But I think over time, people remember that. They remember those little things more than they remember, like, you know, standing in town 
in Stormland, mm-hmm. they might remember something about a place that they spent a lot of time in before that they have really fond memories sure. of. Sure. I'll never forget the Ninja Turtles reference in the sewers. I thought that was amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All kinds of cool stuff like that. I love fan service. So it was it was a really cool thing. It, you, you What you've described basically is what it's like to build a sandcastle. You're going to do the best job you can. You're eight years old. You got a cup. You got a spoon. You're making this amazing sandcastle. But you know that when mom and dad say, load up the car, we're going home, the surf's just going to come in and take your sandcastle out. And that's kind of what happens to these places when you're done, I yep. guess. That's yep. the way of things. Um, when I had Chris Metzen on the show, he had a lot of deep answers for a lot of questions about what inspires him in his work and mm-hmm. what his sources of inspiration are. And I know you heard that interview. And I really was uh, having a good time with this idea of these guys who are building this amazing stuff. You know, where do they get there? Because we're all getting inspiration from some of the things they're creating. But where are they getting it? If I had to ask you maybe one or two of your biggest sources for inspiration for the kind of work you do at Blizzard, where would you say you find it? Obviously, playing video games, I think, would be clearly the the biggest inspiration overall. Um, You know, playing other games and seeing the the world that they create and then trying to think about how that translates into to what we can do, what I can do Mm -hmm. and playing something that literally like takes your breath away right? That first time you see something. Um, I think that's a huge inspiration. And that doesn't, that extent spans out of video games, right? You see something in a movie. Like we said, we're all pretty much big geeks at heart. You see movies, you play a board game, um, even things on portable systems, stuff like that. Um, I I think for us, it it really just comes to creating things, right? You mentioned Chris Metzen and, uh, you know, Chris has obviously been here a super long time. And what, I've had a a really lucky opportunity to be able to work pretty close with Chris over all of these years and talk about inspiring. I mean, uh, Chris is just, once you get him going, you know, in a meeting, he could just, he can just go off on, on any one individual topic and he can just keep going and keep going and not in a boring way. I mean, like he's building it up, he's coming up with new stuff. And just when you have meetings like that and you see someone so animated, so passionate and so excited about what they're doing, it's really hard to walk out of that room and feel like I, you know, not feel like you want to do everything you can to exceed their expectations. Sure. Yeah. I have to imagine that that's it's um, probably in that in this business anyway, if you're in the right environment and the the right kind of, I guess, um, principles of business are in play that this is how that's supposed to feel. Most people hate meetings. That seems like the kind of meeting I'd want to have all the time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's uh that's why, I, you know, I, I just always go back to, I just feel more than anything, just so lucky. Yeah. You know, I've uh, had a couple other jobs before I ended up at Blizzard and I feel like those helped me get here to be at Blizzard. And it's just, you know, we're obviously growing bigger. We're doing more games. Uh, we're doing more stuff overall, but the real core a blizzard, I think, is really the reason that I stay here because it's the same it was the day I started, which is to really make the best games that we can. And I think at the end of the day, we've got ship dates, we've got to figure out WoW expansions, we've got boosts, and we've got mount stores and all kinds of stuff. But in the end, that that doesn't really have any effect on how awesome I'm going to make the feature that I'm putting into the game. Sure. And for those out there who just want to have a little taste of this, if you ever play an old uh, game called Soul Reaver, or if you ever play a little Ratchet and Clank, just know there's a little Corey inside those. Just a little <laughs> tiny bit. Um, oh, yeah. I got one final question for you. This came from a Twitter account, and I would like to echo it. Uh, this came from David Earl, who asked this following question. I know you're a music fan, so this seems perfect. What is your favorite Metallica song? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, man, that's tough. Um, one. Yeah. Is one of my favorite songs. Um, obviously, I think lots of us love Inner Sandman because I was in high school yeah. for that. And I remember watching it on MTV basically on repeat. It's kind of an anthem. Um, it's pretty awesome. Kind oh, of their, yeah. Their signature thing. It's going to be hard. I mean, that when that when whenever they play that at BlizzCon, everyone's going to lose their minds. You know, it's so hard to find a BlizzCon band that you feel like it, it's going to have a – it's going to touch everyone in some way. At least you – even if you haven't heard of them, you've probably heard a few songs you know about them. And I really feel like Metallica is that one where there's lots of, even if you're not into Metallica, you've probably heard of them. Yep. But the other thing is we know that they are going to rock so hard on Saturday night. 
Um, and I think that's just one of the biggest things at BlizzCon, right? Like we all want to let loose. We all work super hard. We've got our biggest fans in the world here to, to celebrate with us. And, you know, I think it's just awesome to have have a band like that's really going to just kill it. I'm pretty excited. It's going to be great. Um, that's coming up. If uh, I, I assume you're you're always excited for this thing. But, you know, you got to get on stage. You got to be on the spotlight and all that stuff. You nervous at all? You good? You, you set? <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah. You get pretty it's, excited, uh, is my memory. Is you're, every year, you're pretty stoked. Oh, man, it's one of my favorite parts of the year. I think a lot of us look at it like, you know, BlizzCon is kind of like this gas station. We work all year. We spend all our gas trying to put everything we have into the game. And then you go to BlizzCon, and you just totally fill the tank on all the energy from all of our players. There's nothing like, you know, the show floor during the day. You go to the, the Hilton Bar at night. You just go out and there's just people everywhere. You see Blizzard shirts, you see the badges, and everyone wants to stop and talk to you. And, and they want to stop and talk to you because that's why they're there, right? I feel like they want to really feel, you know, it's not just about playing the game. It's getting to meet the people that make the game, getting to feel the energy behind why we do all this stuff. You know, and to me, it's just, I feel so honored and lucky to be able to go and have that experience. So it's like, how could you not look forward to something like that? Yeah, it's really exciting. I can't wait. It's uh, just a few weeks away, folks. And if you see Corey in the bar or something, make sure you say hi. Uh, you may even get a Nintendo 3DS friend code out of him. I don't know. Oh, yeah, that could definitely happen. <laughs> <laughs> always got that thing in tow. Uh, Corey, it's always a pleasure, man. Thanks for being on the show again. No problem. It's super fun. Yeah, I'll look forward to not only the game, but uh, seeing you guys in November. And uh, hopefully we'll get to do our tradition again, maybe sooner than that even. It'd be great. Yeah, that's the goal. It's always the goal. All right, man. <laughs> Stay out of trouble. We'll talk to you again. Okay, bye. Woo, there we go. That was great. Nicely done. Always fun. Oh, I, uh, yeah, it's great. I, I was more nervous about this one. I think it's because it's not, I don't think it's because of you. I think it's because we did video this time, and for whatever reason, that just, like, tweaked me. So, like, yeah. The whole time going, oh, I just shit. tried to look at your box on the screen instead of look at the camera. So I think that, like, <laughs> that works better. <laughs> it's all good, man. I think it worked out great. But seriously, thanks for taking the time. And, um yeah, we'll uh, we'll hopefully do this again real soon. And so you're going to be at BlizzCon, right? I will. I'll be there. Yep. We'll. Okay, uh, in well, fact, we'll I'm staying in the Hilton for once, which will be oh, great. Oh, you are. Yeah. Last okay, year, so am I. last year is in some crappy uh, condo thing up the road, and it was just a pain because we had to go back there every night and then come out every morning. And this will be so much easier. So I'm I'm 100 percent sure we'll see each other finally. Okay. Yeah. Definitely track me down. I'm going to be up there Thursday for the benefit dinner, and I'll be around till Sunday. Well, cool, so. man. That's awesome. Well, thanks again. No problem. I'll talk to you later. Okay, talk to you later. All right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, I got so wrapped up, I didn't look at you guys in the chat as much as I meant to. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourselves. And yes, Randy Deluxe was in the room. That was cool. I have to text him and say hi. Uh, oh yeah, I got to fix that Gru, Thank you for the update. I will do that here shortly. All right. Thank you guys very much. We will, I'll have this up on the feed soon. So if you came in late, we'll have it up pretty quick and I'll put the video on YouTube so you can watch that as well. It's going to do it. We'll see you later. Bye now.